Hi ladies, I'm Orchid Tao, your host for the Extraordinary Love Series, where the world's best love, relationship, sex, and dating experts have come together to show you how to find your right man and create a relationship that is fulfilling and long lasting. And today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Lisa Lieberman Wang. She is a best-selling author and the creator of neuroassociative programming, which is, an, is a method that aims to help people heal their lives as fast as possible. Thanks for being with us, Lisa. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. So tell us, how did you come into doing the work that you do? Well, you know what? It was never a path I had chosen. I believe it chose me. And like anything else, I've been working with individuals and entrepreneurs, teaching them how to build business, build money, and everything else for decades. Wow. And I had not seen this as my path until the fact that I've been doing charity work for the last 23 years. And one of the people who has mentored me over the years said to me, you're supposed to be helping women. And I said, well, I, I do, I'm here. And they said, no, 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 you're playing small. You need to do it even bigger. And I balked at the whole concept of doing it. And I felt like the contribution and, and service I provide all the time for like a couple of months a year, I, I've been volunteering my services. Um, I felt like that was more than enough. And she said, no. And I walked away. I, I said, no, it, uh, it wasn't going to happen. And a year later, literally to the same week, I woke up out of a sleep and I turn around, I come downstairs and I said to my husband, I call him handsome. And I was like, handsome, I'm supposed to save lives. I said, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it's going to be, but you're going to run the businesses. I'm going to do this. And that was it. And find to fab started because of somebody planting a seed and it took a year to grow. That is so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, oh no, I see more of the self-help people going to business, you know, that in that order. And so you went in the other order. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so in terms of romantic relationship, what do you believe, where do you believe a person needs to be in order um, to attract the right partner and create extraordinary love? Where do they need to be with themselves? Well, I mean, that's always the most important thing to me is in any relationship, most people are looking for a relationship to complete themselves. And the truth is that the best relationships come when you're already whole and there's two whole people coming together versus two people looking for someone to complete them. I think when they had that Jerry Maguire movie, everybody was like, yes, you complete me. And all the women swooned and got excited. And this is awesome. Um, but the truth is, is that if you're not complete, when you come into a relationship, if anything ever happens, you'll always feel like there's a piece missing. My husband used to say, you know, people would say one plus one equals two. And when you're in a complete relationship and you're coming whole, it's one plus one equals 11. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very different perspective when we get into relationships where we're not looking for somebody um, to be the other half, but you have something to bring to a relationship. So I believe the first thing we need to do is learn to fly and fly stands for first love yourself. Oh, I love that. That is beautiful. Do you have any um, really tangible tips or tools, maybe one or two things that women can do to really start that process? Well, I have a lot of actually, and I, I'm wishing I had it in front of me right now. Um, you know, I have the seven secrets to fab and the seven secrets to fab is really about first acknowledging fear and doubt, knowing things that we do to ourselves, finding different ways where we might not have the best vocabulary. We might not say nice things to ourselves and that are detrimental as well as other things that we do, um, not just to ourselves, but to people around us. I think it all starts with with the seven secrets to fab, you know, breaking through toxic meanings and emotions, taking inventory of life's lessons of things we've done and why we do it. You know, in love, what happens is it's one of our basic human needs. Every single person wants love, right? And we feel that if we don't get love, we feel we're not enough. So if we understand that those two premises come back to the studies back in the 1600s, is when people actually finally figured out that these are the two primary needs people have, that I want love, and if I don't get love, I'm not enough. 
And most people in relationships are looking for the love they never got. Biggest challenge with that is not the love that they got, but the love they didn't get. So we usually crave the love of someone's love we never were able to get the way we wanted it. And even for me, I happen to have been married before. And the first marriage was I married the person who resembled the person's love I couldn't get. He wasn't emotionally available. He was verbally abusive. He was all these other things. And quite honestly, that was my dad. Yeah. So, so it was like, wow, what am I doing? I'm repeating history because I didn't take care of me and love myself enough. I still looked for someone to fill that void. Remember, like that not enough. And then I find someone and I find out, oh my God, this person's abusive. It's totally not okay. And when I started loving myself and I was flying, I had my own wings. I was taken off and this person totally was trying to pull me down and I needed to get out of that. Today I'm in a very happy relationship. I'm married 18 years and the difference is when I met my husband now, I was already whole. I wasn't coming to him as someone broken and needing to be fixed. Very big difference in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, and it, what do you feel the, the main differences are between those two types of relationships? Because most people have that first one um, and they stay in that first one and that pattern. So what can people look forward to if they do the work? Well, if they do the work, they can look forward to being happy. I mean, I have an expression, living an authentic life, happy, healthy, and free. And what happy, healthy, and free means, quite honestly, is happy with yourself happy with yourself and who you are, what you stand for, what makes you happy, and all the other things. Healthy mind, body, spirit, taking care of yourself in all areas, taking care of what you put in your body, like in negative thoughts, positive thoughts. What are you putting in here? What are you putting in here and in your mouth? Like mind, body, and spirit. And free is free from any of the things that hold you back, whether any form of self-sabotage, of stinking thinking, or perseverating over things, or procrastination, or um, using vehicles like alcohol or food or other things to make yourself feel better. Like Ben and Jerry's never solved a problem before, but yet a lot of people think they do, you know? Um, so in all that respect, it's, it's about coming whole into a relationship. And, and when you do, you're going to just have so much more. Mm -hmm. And about self-sabotage, can you define what that is and some common ways people do that in relationships Absolutely. In general. <laughs> well you know self-sabotage shows up in a lot of different ways it's any vehicle that we're using to hurt ourselves you know some people do use the stinking thinking and they say bad things or some people in a relationship will find ways to to provoke arguments or fights because it's easier to do that maybe they're not getting the attention they want maybe instead of getting attention in a positive way they've only learned how to get attention in a negative way so what they'll do is they'll sabotage it by picking a fight or an argument, like I'm not getting enough attention. So if I, if I have a fight, they're going to give me a lot more attention. Or maybe I'm not getting enough romance, so let's have a fight, and then we make up after, and that becomes the pattern that they've created, you know, to be able to do that. Or maybe you're not getting attention and you decide, well, in, you know, the, the Turkey Hill ice cream or Ben and Jerry's is giving you more attention than your relationship, so you start giving attention to food, and before you know it, you're using food to be able to create the love and connection you want, or you're using it to keep people away. I've seen more women get heavy as their way of keeping their, their significant other or even any man away from them because then they don't have to deal with it. So if I'm fat and un unattractive, no one will bother me. But the challenge with that, there are men who love fat and unattractive women, so it's not really the answer. But it might be their answer to not having to be tempted by other people or other people hitting on them or their own significant other, wanting more of them, making themselves unattractive so they won't be asked to be performing or be present for them. There's so many ways that women self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And it's a, would you say it's an unconscious way of pretty much robbing yourself of your own happiness and peace and yeah, in, a, in a lot of ways, you know, I know, I don't think people, well, sometimes they do. Sometimes it's a conscious decision, but more than often it's unconscious where, you know, you're, you're picking an argument and you don't realize it's just because you want attention. And there's so many other ways to get it. 
You know, I remember, and I have, I'm in a relationship where my husband, I think I can count on my hand in 18 years, how many real arguments we've ever had. And that's pretty amazing because I don't have enough hands and feet to count the first relationships arguments. <laughs> it was very different. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, things are going so great. And if you're used to chaos, you're going to create chaos because that's what you're used to. Mm -hmm. And that's where people will do things like that without even realizing it. Those are the unconscious things until they realize, you know, what need are they really trying to fill and why are they doing it? And then find a better way to do it. Like if you want attention, it doesn't have to be through a fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. That is such an amazing thing. Um, and I'm experiencing that in my own relationship uh, where it's like, when did we last fight? I can't even remember. You know, it's like months and months and it's like, it just gets longer and longer, you know, the time in between of, and it's, it's, it's so great. <laughs> or before it was like definitely weekly. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was daily in some of those, you know, where you would fight and have that whole negative dark cloud over you. And, and that is more of the norm than um, having something that actually works and it feels really great. And, brings out the best in you and each other. Yeah, well, and it doesn't have to be a norm. I mean, the arguments are something that honestly don't need to happen. And I can count the, the handful of times are pretty much within the same period of time in our relationship. So we could, we'll go years without an argument. And the, finding the, the arguments will probably end up being only around one major issue. It's always finance. <laughs> other than that, it's like there's nothing to fight about, really. And, right. and even there, there's nothing to fight about. It's only when expectations don't meet reality that we have conflict. So if one of us has a different expectation for something, and that was usually what happened, and the other one didn't have the same belief system, that's when there was a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would imagine that you have tools to work through uh, conflict when they come up. Always, always. You know, I think it's important to understand what's really being said. Not what's said, but what's really being said. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times people are arguing and they need to have a lesson and how to have a fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not about what happened last week, last month, last year. It's what's happening right now. But a lot of times people fight with bringing in the whole life. It's like bringing in a smorgasbord of everything that's wrong. But it's really this one thing, but we're going to talk about everything else. But what's really going on? And most of the time, if you actually got to the root of what was really wrong, it's not the first thing that was said. It's usually underlying something more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, do you feel like when should, okay, so let's go to if you're, you found your right man um, or you feel like he's your potential right man, what do you feel um, are steps that new couples uh, or new dating people should take to establish a foundation for a really great relationship that's going to actually work. And okay. Well, I think the first thing is to start the relationship with being honest from the beginning. You know, not saying I love sports and then you, you end up being with the guy and you hate sports and you end up being a sports widow every Sunday and wonder why that happened, you know? Like, like why, why be something you're not to go get a person then you end up with the wrong person because it's not even who you are or he is. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is being real authentic with who you are, what you want. I remember when, um, when I had gone through the process and I actually did, I had wrote a list and I think everybody should do this of their ultimate mate. This is the best exercise we can all do. Like get into your best state. Like we put on some music, dance, feel really wonderful. And, and then write down like if you can not, not judge, but if you can have anything you want, describe the guy, what he looks like, what he sounds like, how what he represents, how he walks, what he does, everything about the person, you know, what he likes, what he doesn't like, do the whole thing of this ultimate mate. And then there's one more thing that you need to do after you do that exercise is you need to write another list. Who do you need to be to attract that person? Because people will say, well, I want tall, dark, and handsome. I want him to be rich. I want him to be this. I want him to treat me like a queen or a princess, whatever. And they have this list, but then they come out like a bitch and they come out all this stuff and they're like, well, why isn't he treating me like that? I'm like, well, what do you need to be to attract this prince or king? You know, what do you need to be? And a lot of people don't think like that. They just want, want, want. You know, you want someone who, who takes care of themselves, who's, you know, all this other stuff. But do you take care of yourself? 
You know, all those pieces have to come together. And when I had met my husband, I, he was actually like, he was, it was funny. I had my list and I've done it. And I did my list. I was already married to my first husband. And I knew that was already, you know, how do I make this work? Um, I made my list for what I wanted in this relationship. And my husband turns it around and he asks me about my list. And I said, well, you're a 9.8. And he said, well, why aren't I a 10? I said, well, I asked for tall, dark, and handsome. I just didn't expect Asian. And, <laughs> you know, and that was it because my dad was a bigot. My dad was Archie Bunker, and he didn't come to our wedding. He didn't acknowledge my wedding. And um, so it was more about a cultural thing. You know, it was like that's, I wasn't expecting that kind of conflict in my family, you know. And everything else about him was perfect. So, you know, that was really important is, is knowing what you want, but I always wanted to be treated like a princess. And here, the one thing I said is don't do anything for a day that you won't do for a lifetime. And, and my husband knows that I said, or I'll leave you too, because my ex was courting me until he caught me. And when he caught me, he stopped opening doors and doing nice things and princess status disappeared. And I was like, no, 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 princess status has to stay. <laughs> So I have 18 years of princess status, but that means I need to treat him like a prince. Oh, I love that. That is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it works wonderfully. I mean, most people think we're, we're honeymooners, which is so funny. And it's like, they go, how long are you married? We're like, what do you get, 18 years? Like, really? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's so important, what you said. You stated those things in the beginning. Hey, whatever you do for a day, you're going to do forever. <laughs> Right, and this, and this is my husband. I'm going to show the picture. So this, this, this is my handsome, and and I think that that's really what's important is that you know that it's mutual. I, I have to show the same respect I ask of him, and and I think a lot of times women don't understand that they want things to be done for them, but they're not willing to do. It doesn't work, and it has to be a hundred percent each. It's not like fifty fifty. I'll do this if you do that. That's horse trading. Um, and it never lasts very long and it's, it's a scorecard and, and it's just not a good plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love it. Now we're going to go a little bit to, um, a different topic. <laughs> I know that you mentioned on your website that you have experienced sexual abuse yeah. and did that ever cause you to hate men? It, it's interesting because my, when I was growing up, my mom always said to me, never trust a man because she had had a negative experience. So she, I grew up with that. And it almost turned out that, you know, I didn't want to be my mom and believe that. And then it turned out as I was taken advantage of on a date when I was 16. And the first thing I was told when, um, when I shared it was don't tell your dad because he'll kill you because I wasn't allowed to be dating. So that was already, you know, already one mistake. I wasn't supposed to be dating and here was an older boy who took advantage of me. And so I took it as I did something wrong instead of he did something wrong. So you would think that I'd be angry at all men, but instead I was angry at myself. And I had a lot of shame and blame of what I did because the person I confided in made me feel like I did something wrong. So, you know, did I, did I work, it was, I, did I have anger and other stuff towards men? I think I spent most of my life trying to get men's approval because of the fact that I couldn't get it from my dad, that I would accept poor behavior from men because I was used to poor behavior. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I didn't Can think I, one more time that I would, that I, I accepted poor behavior for men, from men because I was used to it. Yes. That is yes. so rampant. Yes, it is. <laughs> and the challenge is, is we always return to familiar. You know, I call it fine. And I'm just going to use my phone cover. And fine is the thing. My book is fine to fab. And fine is how I used to feel, which was effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. And I felt fabulous, awesome, beautiful would be better. But I was always fine. I was always, you know, I, I was n never enough, so it didn't matter. So when people would treat me poorly, it didn't, you know, I didn't like it, but I felt like I was used to it. My dad did it. My nickname growing up from my father was AH, which was asshole, and I thought princess would be better. So I was kind of abused verbally for years, and then I was abused emotionally and then physically by strangers. So 
it turned out that that was a pattern I fell into until I, until I stopped it and said, this is crazy and no one can abuse me anymore and I need to stop abusing me because when they weren't abusing me, I was abusing me and I was using food. So I would be binging and purging. I became bulimic and um, I had a sudden heart attack by the time I was 18 and I was sick for 13 years. And I just used food to feel better. So when I wasn't getting love, it's like looking for love in all the wrong places. When I wasn't getting where I wanted it, I used food as my, as my confident, my friend, my ally, which wasn't my friend. But at least it, it didn't talk back to me, didn't call me names. I knew what to expect. And it became my lover, seriously, mm -hmm. um, until it was no longer working and I needed to stop the, the behavior. So... When I finally made that decision, and to me, a decision is put an end to any other option, I stopped doing that. So it's been 23 years since I've hurt myself. And it's been 23 years, quite honestly, since anybody else ever hurt me. Mm -hmm. So that is such an important um, topic. You have to really want to stop hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning of self-love. Yes, absolutely. Because you can demand from everybody else for them to be nice to you. But here's the facts. None of us will be nice to someone we don't like. Right. So it, we need to like ourselves first so that we can at least be nice to ourselves and then expect the same thing from other people to treat us that way too. Mm -hmm. So would you say uh, self-hatred is the root of why women attract men that are undeserving? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a blanket statement. Um, I'm sure it has a lot to do with the fact that if they, if they actually cared for themselves, well, I don't know if they hate themselves, is maybe they dislike themselves, or maybe they don't think they're worthy. I think the word is feeling worthiness would be a stronger word for me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that women would actually admit hating themselves. It's more of the admitting. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe it's worthiness. Like, feel like I'll never get someone like that or I'm not worthy or whatever the case is. Um, I know for me, I, I knew that when I was no longer gonna abuse myself, nobody else was either. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think I hated myself, I just didn't think it for a time that I'd ever get what I really wanted or I was worthy for it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I see that more often is people settle for whatever they think they can get. And people are exactly where they believe they're supposed to be. Right. Um... Yes, I work with clients who have a really hard time. You know, when I say make that list of your ideal mate, it's some of them have such a hard time. It's like a block. They can't even do it because it's just like they're like, it's impossible to have. I'm not even going to write it down because I don't even believe it can happen. <laughs> right. Or they'll tell you what they don't want, but they can't tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. Right. So what, whatever you focus on, you get. So they'll get exactly what they don't want because that's what all their focus goes to. Right. So do you have any tips for breaking limiting beliefs? Well, first is get my book because it's seven, but I'm not, I'm not saying that facetiously. I mean that because in the book, Find to Fab, it's seven steps and it's actually a workbook. So you can answer the questions. It's like, you don't even know you're doing limiting beliefs. You mentioned it before. A lot of times it's unconscious state that we're in where if you don't believe you deserve it or worthy of certain things you're going to find ways to sabotage yourself and even when you know somebody go well this is a this is a better relationship this guy is so nice and everything else if you didn't take care of the core it's just another guy another name this is tom this is harry this is john but they're all the same guy because you never changed you and until we change the core and we first fly, we're going to continue to, to find anchors to pull us down, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I would love for you to tell us about your free gift. Well, actually, the free gift is, is something that I think would be great for everybody. That would be a great start for them. Is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with everybody a free gift of a webinar that I did called Seven Secrets to Fab. Mm -hmm. And Seven Secrets to Fab goes over the stuff that's in the book about how to overcome self-sabotage. And that's whatever form of self-sabotage you're using, whether it's stinking thinking or, or procrastinating or, or food or alcohol or any form of self-sabotage that people are using. But how to break that cycle, interrupt the pattern, get control, find out what you really want, change the tape. And, um, and to be happier. And if this is something that once you watch it, 
um, this is a big one and this is something that I'm going to offer is after watching the webinar, if you decide that this is something that you want to learn more and you're ready to take the next step, um, I invite you to schedule a private consultation with me and that's normally a $500 value. So you'll get all the information once you watch the webinar and, um, and I look forward to speaking to you and taking you where you want to go. Awesome. Thank you for that Thank beautiful you. gift. So everybody grab that. There are obviously some valuable tools in there that you can start using to make very important changes in your life so that you can attract extraordinary love. Thank